Hi everybody, this is Liam Martin from Running Remote and in today's video we're going to be talking about event marketing. If you are like me, you probably are interested in event marketing. I know I was about a year and a half to two years ago before we pulled the trigger, cut a $100,000 check and prayed that people will actually show up to a conference that we were running on building remote teams which no one had actually done before. So we're going to be talking about in this video how to actually set um, up an event, how to actually run an event successfully. Uh, we're going to include our full profit and loss statement and whether or not we actually made money at the conference. So stay tuned. First question, is there actually a need for your conference? This was a question that we had because about two years ago, me and Igor, who is the GM and co-organizer of the conference, he actually came to me and we were asking about a whole bunch of questions about building and scaling large remote teams, which we have. We have almost 100 people in 20 different countries all over the world. And we said to ourselves, where's the conference for this? There are a whole bunch of conferences around being a digital nomad, but there were no conferences on building large scale remote teams. So we validated that by actually asking our customers and that was something that was a big kind of jump for us because there were no similar events in our space. And we thought to ourselves, have people just kind of missed the boat on this? Because I pay a lot of money to be able to learn all this type of information. And uh, that initially gave us a lot of apprehension, but we recognized from surveying our customers that there was a need for this type of conference. So that was the first thing that we really jumped out at. Another one that kind of jumped out at us as a concern was Nomad versus building remote team. So what we initially looked at was there are a lot of conferences for being a digital nomad. Uh, that's not really us, we're more remote workers. So traveling is an essential part of the way that we do business, we just work from home. Sometimes we travel, I'm actually traveling right now. I'm in Selena, Cancun, uh, which is a fantastic co-working slash kind of co-living space for remote workers, but a lot of our staff don't do that. So that was a major concern for us and we thought to ourselves, is there actually a larger community out there? So how do you actually assemble a team? Uh, that's something that a bunch of people are asking. I think that you just kind of have to do it. I know for us, we recognized from the very early stages, we said to ourselves, if we lose $100,000 and we learn how to basically hire people even 10% better than what we were doing before, it would totally be worth it. So we cut a check for 100 grand and then we actually started going out and looking for partners. And thankfully, we actually ended up partnering with a fantastic local asset in Ubud, which is the co-working space Hubud run by Steve. Uh, Steve has been a fantastic mentor of ours and really built out um, all of the local concerns that we had. He actually already runs a successful conference on co-working, so he was the, a perfect fit to be able to partner with. And uh, we actually borrowed or he loaned us some of his staff uh, we actually ended up getting a ton of volunteers as well to be able to work with us on the day of the event or the days of the event. On average, it probably, we had one full-time person for about six months and then we had a bunch of secondary people that we were borrowing from our other companies, timedoctorandstep.com, to be able to work uh, on the conference for approximately a month. I think we estimated it was about 640 hours of labor to be able to run the entire event, which for us is probably, again, the minimum investment that you would wanna be able to make on top of the check that you gotta cut uh, to run an event like this. Next question, where do you actually host the conference. This is a big question that a lot of people have. Uh, for us, we actually ended up just again surveying our customers. So we had, uh, we basically just grabbed everyone that was using Time Doctor, our tool for managing remote teams, and we plotted them on a tool called Intercom. <clears throat> Brought up about 13,000 people, and we found that there were three separate hotspots. There was a hotspot in the Philippines, there was a hotspot in the United States, 
and there was a hotspot in Eastern Europe. And these were people that actually uh, own businesses, the owners of those businesses. So we kind of analyzed all the data and we realized that Ubud Bali would be a great fit. Igor actually lives in Ubud, so he was a local asset that could work there with all of the events, and, uh, event people and the venue. And we had a bunch of other people that were actually located in Ubud, which was really easy. And <clears throat> for us, uh, we realized that it was a destination location as well. A lot of people have on their bucket list to go to Bali and this kind of gave them the excuse to be able to convince their boss to be able to jump on a plane and fly down to Bali. Or if you're the owner of that business, it gave you the excuse to be able to write it off. So that's why we ended up going with Bali. There are four questions that you should really ask when choosing a location for your conference. So can it actually accommodate your guests? Meaning we have a group of high net individuals, net worth individuals. So you want to be able to make sure that they have a nice, comfortable environment. Uh, they don't really want to stay in a Howard Johnson's for $50 a night. They want to stay in a bit of a nicer place. And that kind of connects with the price of tickets, which we'll get into later. Uh, next question is, is it actually appealing to your speakers? It's really important to be able to make sure that the speakers enjoy the venue as well, which is really important. And then can people actually get work done? Uh, so is there Wi-Fi? Is it readily available? We actually ended up paying to boost the Wi-Fi at the venue that we were at. And that was a big uh, extra expense for us. And we made sure that everyone could access Wi-Fi at the event because they're all working remotely. So they need to be able to do a Skype call as an example with their team if an emergency pops up during the conference. So we included that as well. And then last question is, will people actually have a good time? Uh, so are people actually gonna enjoy themselves? Because if they're not enjoying themselves, if it's not a unique venue that they really enjoy, then they're probably not gonna come back and, uh, and go to the conference again. And then also secondarily, is the actual uh, speaker talks really engaging and that's a variable that you can't fundamentally really control for but you can completely control for venue so that's something that uh, we made sure we did as good of a job on as humanly possible so how we chose speakers uh, that's another question that people have and if for us we honestly just literally surveyed our customers so we said hey who are the big influencers in remote work for you who would you love to have speak at a conference and we ended up with a really awesome list, which you can see right here. Uh, we ended up reaching out to approximately 84 speakers and we had 24 that just said yes. Uh, we also had another group of about 15 to 20 people that were kind of on the button and uh, were kind of interested, but there were conflicts. So we actually think that that was a pretty successful uh, rate for most of these people were reaching out to cold, only a very select few of them I had personal connections with. Another thing that you might want to be able to do is we put up uh, a speaker kind of form on our website and we actually ended up getting a lot of speaker requests uh, from that form. So if you're going to run a conference, I would suggest that you do that too. You do have to end up going through a lot of people that probably aren't qualified, but you can definitely send them a kind of special discounted ticket as an example if they put the time into actually putting in an application. And those are the people that should absolutely be attendees at your event. So you wanna be able to make sure that you're treating them really nicely. And it's a great way just to kind of see where, gauge where your event is at. If there's a whole bunch of people that wanna speak at your event, then it's probably uh, a good sign that you're moving in the right direction. Next question, how much should you actually charge? And this was something that we ended up having a bit of a debate over. We ended up charging quite a bit. So the top end uh, sticker price for the conference is $1,000 for a ticket. And I believe we started at approximately $500 and then moved up from there. And the reason why we did that was we actually wanted people to attend the event that could afford that type of ticket price. So a lot of other events for digital nomads are $100, $200. And we realized that that really wasn't 
a type of attendee that we wanted. Uh, we wanted someone that was running a large team. The average team size for companies that attended the conference was 106 people. And uh, we wanted to be able to make sure that those people were coming and we didn't have people that had one or two employees because those are the ones that we really didn't want to learn from. We wanted to learn from attendees that had 50 people, 100 people, 200 people inside of their companies. And part of that is just charging more for a ticket. You can also provide a much higher quality experience at let's say the $500 to $1,000 price point as opposed to the $100 to $300 price point for an event like that. Also, just from me generally talking to other event organizers, there seems to be a bit of a black hole in between 300 and 1,000 attendees. So 300 and below, the uh, you can run a really nice intimate event and charge a lot of money for that event. Three uh, 1,000 plus, you can get sponsors that will pay you $100,000, dollars to be kind of in your event uh, and, and be and basically be sponsors in some capacity. We really targeted the bottom end of that spectrum. On our first year, we ended up getting 251 attendees that were coming in. And then after that, we ended up really taking, um, we did get sponsors obviously that actually helped us out in running the event. We actually got a ton of fantastic sponsors, but um, our goal was to be able to make sponsors a bigger part of the conference moving forward. So we're trying to get to that thousand attendee mark in which we can really do a 50-50 split. So 50% of our revenue would come from sponsors and 50% of our revenue would come from attendees. Uh, I think we're actually gonna hit that target this year, which is fantastic. And uh, for me, it was just a real surprise that sponsors were able to take a risk on us, particularly for the first year that uh, we ran the event. So really for you, you should focus on the customer avatar, who you really wanna target. That should really define what your pricing is. So if these guys are, let's say, sub million dollar businesses, you probably want a $100 to $300 ticket price. If they're million to $10 million, you probably want to charge, I would say, $500 to even $2,500 or $5,000. I think that's a fair ticket price for a business that floats around that spot. Uh, $10 million plus, you're probably not going to get many of the founder level people in those types of businesses because they're quite busy but you might have their HR director or their director of marketing or something like that. And that, again, would probably be in the same ballpark in terms of price point. Next, how do you actually promote the conference? So in our experience, 23% of our customers, attendees, came from email. That was actually the top form of advertising for us. So literally getting ourselves to email, for the conference and then also getting uh, partners to email for the conference. That was probably the best source of overall ticket sales for us. Second one was social media. So literally posting on Facebook, on Instagram, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, then the third one was speakers. Basically rarely email their lists. Uh, it was an, actually a very interesting insight for us. So speakers would rarely email their list, but sponsors who had already paid us actually emailed their lists, which was great. Uh, recognizing that in the future, we're probably actually going to reach out to sponsors a lot more often because they seem to be oddly a lot more excited about sponsoring than the speakers themselves, or emailing their list than the speakers themselves, which was weird, uh, but we went with it anyways. It was, it was actually pretty cool. Basically emailing email lists. That was the biggest driver of growth. And anything else that you can do really does help. But, uh, and it is also kind of cumulative. So you'll get someone on an email list and then you'll do a little bit of retargeting, then maybe they'll get on your Instagram and they'll end up converting at one point. So you, you need to pay attention to all of those forms of advertising, but email was by far uh, the most productive source for us in terms of marketing and the cheapest as well. So we also made a ton of mistakes running the conference. And the biggest one that I think we made is we actually underestimated our budget by approximately $35,000. We 
We initially had a budget of $50,000 and that ballooned to $84,500 and change. Uh, so I would probably say, number one, go to the post. We have our full profit and loss statement right there. So we ended up actually losing $1,800 on the initial P&L. When we actually looked at the later P&L, we ended up making uh, a little bit of money, which was, which was great. But I'm going to say we lost $1,800 because that was the initial kind of assessment that we did. But make sure that you're looking at that P&L so you're understanding all of the costs and how they connect. And then even if you're negotiating with a resort venue, as an example, you can tell what, whether or not you're getting ripped off because you'll have the prices for what we paid. Just assess your costs and make sure that you're keeping them in control. They can very quickly run off on you. I think we had over $2,000 worth of just cars, as an example. If we had been a little bit more focused on our budget or had hired a volunteer to be able to drive uh, us around, it would have put us into profitability instantaneously. Second big mistake that we made is the resort only allowed vegan and vegetarian food on premises. Meat was not allowed on the premises. And that was a big problem. It actually ended up being one of the worst things that attendees had to say about the conference. So make sure that you have food options for everybody. A buddy of mine that runs conferences all the time says, just make sure that the venue is okay and the food is okay. We didn't make sure that the food was okay. And I think that was a big problem. So we fixed that for next year. Third mistake that we made is we didn't have VIP options. So we've found out that some attendees spent thousands and thousands of dollars getting to the venue and uh, actually staying very close to the venue and they could have spent a lot less money but they just didn't care because they really wanted that information and they would have easily paid for more access to the speakers or a more intimate experience with the speakers and that was something that we should have done. Uh, we didn't do it because we recognized that we just wanted to get our conference finished and that was it. But uh, realizing that now we are running a kind of like ultra VIP event as well that connects to the conference. If you're interested in that, uh, please ask down below in the comments and I will get back to you for sure on that particular subject. But just giving basically attendees the opportunity to pay you more money is something that you should always do and we did not do that. The last mistake is making sure that we had all of our tracking pixels and documentation in place for conversion. So we ended up having uh, less than 50% of our conversions were documented properly through Google Analytics or through some of our other pixels that we had set up and that was a major problem for us moving forward because we wouldn't we didn't really know where to put all of our bullets for next year. So there might have been some form of marketing that we didn't think was as effective because it wasn't tracked properly. So uh, we went pretty quick. We literally threw a website together in under a month and we said, hey, let's do it. But we should have audited all of our tracking pixels beforehand. We've done that this year so that we know exactly where conversions are coming from, which is a lot easier. Ask any question about marketing a event that uh, you have, put them down below and I'll be able to answer them because uh, that's basically what I do on this channel all day long is I just answer your questions. And if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you really like this video, please subscribe to this channel. We talk about this stuff all day long. This is all we do on this YouTube channel. If you're thinking of launching a conference or if you have launched a conference, I'd love to be able to get some more insight on basically uh, whether we did things completely wrong or completely right. So please put that down in the comments below as well. So thanks a lot and I'll see you in the next video.